Thank you, Sheldon, and thank you, uh, Dr. Rick. I look forward to the discussion that will happen right after all presenters have presented, and we can actually talk about these um, ideas in at length. Uh, now we turn to Olivia Chow, and um, I think that most of you around here would know Olivia. She's been a school trustee, city councilor, MP, and uh, they seem to love her in all these, you know, newspaper reviews, uh, top counselor, best counselor, best looking counselor, hardest working counselor, all those. And um, I, I asked, see, we, we didn't even know what it is that these people were presenting until until now, I mean, <laughs> I mean, the first time I'm hearing about green concrete was uh, when Rick was here. I just asked Olivia if she'll be talking about social justice because that's what we know her, you know, to be famous for. But no, she's apparently been transformed, and now she's a transit buff, and she'll be talking about transit. So, and I asked her, um, is it costed out? Because you know, the NDP usually, you know, when they. <laughs> <laughs> Is she assure that's your role. She she assures me that it is. So we'll ask um, Olivia Chow to uh, come to the microphone and give us her big idea. <laughs> For the big idea, I need to grow a few more inches. <laughs> Wow, great to see everyone here. If anyone have uh, ever been unemployed, you know that sinking feeling. And you feel, oh, soon I will find a job. But as you see your saving slowly disappearing, you get worried a bit more, and then you see the paycheck that's not coming in, and you notice that you have to pay rent, or pay the mortgage, and then you have to figure out how am I gonna make do after paying the grocery. Now, being unemployed, you're, you have to go out and find work. And but if you go and try to find work, it means that you have to travel. And it's expensive to travel. If you have a car, it costs. If you take public transit, it's expensive. It's getting more expensive in this city. <clears throat> uh, so what do people do? Sometimes some of the people that are unemployed um, decide not to go for that interview, or sometimes they even uh, have to worry about getting evicted. So my idea is not new or big, but it is fairly simple, which is basically say to the unemployed, and here in Toronto, there's 130,000 people, that's one out of 10 people, almost 10 people that are unemployed in Toronto. So say that if you're unemployed, let us give you a half price public transit pass, a TDC Metro pass that's half price. Some of you like the idea. It makes sense. Thank you. And why does it make sense? Because it means that they are able to go and find a job faster. They feel more confident. They're less isolated at home. They can go out more. And in Toronto and GTA, uh, we are very spread out, even though the condos are being built. Only 15% of the metropolitan jobs are located in downtown, and a third of the jobs are 10 kilometers radius around the center, which means that people have to take public transit in order to get to their jobs or to find the jobs. And, and in some areas, um, the highest income has almost four times better public transit service than those that have the lowest income. Area with poor transit have been have seen their median household income actually decline in the past 30 years. So you know that 
people that have lower income pay a lot more in public transit in terms of their, 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 their total pot of money that they have. So it makes sense for us to help subsidize um, these, uh, these, these people that are looking for jobs. And why does it make sense? Because we will make that money back when they find a job. They will start paying taxes. They will start paying taxes sooner if they find a job sooner. And that um, it is an idea that is very much accepted all around the world. Uh, let me give you a few examples. We have in, uh, in US, through the Federal Transport Authority, has a job access and reverse commute program, which started in 1998. It, an annual program of a bit uh, more than $170 million. It, it aims to improve transit service to low-income and unemployed people. About $7 million is given to individuals that are unemployed there uh, or in training so they can get free tickets, vouchers, discount passes. They generate roughly about 600,000 riders per year in 38 cities. Now, in, out, uh, in Europe, you think of Berlin. Berlin has a 60% discount in place on the monthly tickets for people that are looking for jobs if they're unemployed. It helped turn what was once an economic backwater into one of the most dynamic places for business in Europe. And that's only one example. In Paris, London, they both offer 50% discount for low-income individuals. Beyond Europe, there are places like Adelaide, uh, Australia, Bangkok, Seattle, you name it, they have um, transit passes for low-income or unemployed people. Some there's different. Uh, and in Canada, let's come back to Canada. In Canada, we have, uh, in Calgary, there's a low-income monthly transit pass. It's 50% of the cost of the pass in Calgary. Edmonton has a AS uh, transit pass for people on social assistance. Manitoba has a reduced off-peak bus passes for social assistance recipients at $35 per month. Regina give people on social assistance $15 monthly pass. And by the way, because they increased ridership, the city did not end up paying too much for this program. British Columbia has a reduced bus pass program for people on disabilities. So there's all these programs out there, but it's all fragmented. So what we need to do here in the city of Toronto is say to the federal government, look, you already have an employment program. You have a, 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 a human resource um, department. It deals with employment insurance. And what you can do when people become unemployed, give them a voucher or some kind of coupon, and all they have to do is go to TDC and say that, you know, I'm unemployed, then they can get a discount pass. It's easy to administer. I calculated, yes, I did, uh, uh, did a costing. It's approximately $30 million because it is, uh, uh, because of the NOTO split in Toronto is about 30 to 50%. Um, so uh, it is a program that can roll out, not just in the city of Toronto, it can go right across the country. We have in Canada right now 1.4 million people looking for jobs, and the sooner they can find a job, the better it is for our economy, and the, the, the more ability they have to um, be able to access the public transit, the better it is. Some of them may have a car, but they may decide not to use the car. They may buy a Metro Pass, and therefore it actually will increase the ridership, which will, of course, help TDC and GO Transit. So those are, those are some of my thoughts um, of this whole idea, and uh, I hope that uh, you would like the idea, steal it, and move it forward, because um, we are really behind times as it comes to providing affordable public transit for people that are in need. Uh, so we need to say to the federal government, get on the bus and provide 
affordable transit to people looking for jobs. Thank you. The job gets harder. <laughs> Livy and I have uh, dear friends from many years back. And most often, she has a good idea. But, but not today. You see, my worry is this. I could see it now. Livia stands up, looks at the Prime Minister and says, for $30 million, I've got the answer to unemployment. Prime Minister says, absolutely, let's do it. And we pretend that any problem was really solved. The problem of unemployment goes far, far beyond 50% off a ticket. And in fact, what I would worry about is that you lose sight of the real problem, that is food, shelter, the insurance rates, etc. And we get fooled that there was a problem, that, th that, this, that this is a solution to the problem. So although I'm sympathetic, and would like to say, good idea, I have to say that the bigger idea and the more important idea is solving the real problem of unemployment. And unfortunately, half-price tickets don't work. Hey, the, the booing has already started. Did you hear that? <laughs> Uh, I mean, you, you hear certain people on the radio and then you see them in person, you know, and you, they certainly look a lot different than their voice. Um, I just met uh, Sukyun Lee in the back out there and uh, um, it's interesting, I mean, with, within 10 minutes of uh, meeting her, then you start learning a lot more about her than you really need to know. Um, <laughs> You know, she she started telling us how uh, she's been providing samples, apparently, for Dr. Rick Smith. I have yet. It requires an explanation. Requires an explanation. Urine samples. It sure does require an, ex an explanation. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, for some of his um, experiments. We won't get into that. Maybe they can explain that to you a little bit later. Um, as you know, she's a... Uh, Toronto-based musician, actor, filmmaker, and media personality. She fronted, they said, the art rock band called what? Bob's Your Uncle, before embarking on a solo career. Former Much Music VJ, host, salon-style radio show, Definitely Not the Opera, on CBC Radio One. She's an accomplished filmmaker. Her award-winning uh, short films, Unlocked, Girl Clean Sync, and escapades of the one particular Mr. Noodle have screened internationally. She stars in the adventurous comedy Short Bus, which premiered at Cannes in 2006, and she wrote, directed, and acted in The Brazilian, a chapter in the Toronto stories. Sukian is developing a new movie, Ferreira is Dead, which is a supernatural drama. So obviously she's an interesting woman and uh, the, the other people who came up here and you know just spoke to you apparently she has a presentation. So we look <laughs> so we look forward to it. Come on up. Oh man, I guess that needs some context then, right? The urine samples. I was f trying to find common ground. Uh, Rick's uh, group asked, uh, someone uh, phoned me up and, and asked me if I would provide urine samples. They're doing a test to see about uh, levels of chemicals in our urine. And, and at first I was like, oh, I don't know about having my body stuff tested. And then when they sh sent, I asked for um, some information about it. And, and there are 
certain chemicals that we use on a uh, daily basis that are having some, um, some people are wondering what the ramification of having high levels of antibacterial chemicals is doing to our body. So I thought, well, if my urine can help in trying to figure out some of the conclusions, I will um, spill in, in the, the first urine of the morning. I, I know, sometimes I do talk, I do share a lot, too much, but we just had to like, you know, address that elephant in the room. Okay, so, um, so yeah, 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 I put together this, this presentation, and there you have the screen there. And, um, okay, so, so basically, um, the first, uh, this, this first thing is that sometimes you can find a good idea in your own backyard. And that is me, I took a photo, my, my pal took a photo of me in my backyard last week. And what am I pointing at? But a very good idea that is worth stealing. And um, well, that is a prototype pebble stone mosaic. It was given to me over 15 years ago when I moved to Toronto from Vancouver. And these are my friends who made it and gave it to me when I left my hometown. That's Glenn Anderson and Marina Ziarto. Now, I took this photograph of them this past summer when I moved back to Toronto for a year to support my sister when she was diagnosed with breast cancer. And the thing that I noticed in Vancouver is, of course, the, the city's considerable beauty. But I also really noticed that somehow, in the last 15 years, Glenn and Marina's pebble stone mosaics have proliferated across the city. In fact, they are now everywhere. So here are some examples of, oh, 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 that, that was out of order. But that, that is, uh, that is uh, called Mosaic Creek Park. And that was, the, that was the climax of the whole thing. OK, so <laughs> there we go. So I, I wanted to begin with um, you know, sort of smaller ones that I noticed. So I took these photos whenever I'd see them. I was like, whoa, and they're there, and they're there, and they're there. What the heck happened? So I really wanted to know how their pebble mosaics manifested all throughout the city to increase the beauty uh, of Vancouver. And Glenn told me that in the early 1990s, there was a visionary city official. Her name was Susan Gordon. Now, she, Susan wasn't an artist herself, but she loved art, and she was an arts advocate. Susan worked at Carnegie Center, and that is at the corner of Maine and Hastings. And as you know, it's a very impoverished neighborhood in the downtown east side of Vancouver. So back in the early 90s, Susan came up with a very bright idea and certainly worth stealing, and that is the idea of an artist residency program at Carnegie Center. Basically what it did was it, was it brought together local artists and then people from the community to make art that created dialogue through self-expression through art. And the Carnegie Center, the, the residencies went over so well at that time that over a longer period of time, Susan was given a larger area to work from, and artist residencies began to spread and spring up all over Vancouver's east side. So in the mid-1990s, one of those artists was Paula Jardine. Now, she was a seminal force and continues to be a seminal force in Vancouver's uh, art community. And she created Public Dreams, and that was a group that mounted these incredible community-based live art spectacles. So Paula's background was mostly um, socially engaged, performative, you know, art, uh, art performances. Um, but her 1995 Trout Lake residency was different. This time, Paula's goal was to connect, not performance artists, but visual artists with people from the community to create a work of permanent public art. Now, according to Glenn, um, performance artists and actors, they're much more extroverted. They would love to perform for any audience. But the thing is, with visual artists, they're a little bit more insular. A lot of the time, uh, they're used to working alone by themselves in their studio. So back then, the idea of artists engaging with the public wasn't so popular. But he was interested in it. So when Paula asked him what he'd like to do, he immediately thought of the pebble the pebble mosaics, because pebbles last a thousand years, and they also complemented the sort of natural landscape of Trout Lake. And also, social engagement is a key ingredient, ingredient in all of this, because the mosaics aren't just pretty objects. They can express all kinds of political and personal things, depending on what you put on your mosaic. 
So Glenn and Paula reached out to the high school students who lived in the area near Trout Lake, and they asked them to be their creative collaborators. And together, they taught themselves how to make pebble mosaics, and they designed and built a gorgeous work of permanent public art in Trout Lake. And this idea was very successful, and because of its success, it snowballed, and over the years, pebble tile mosaics flourished throughout the city. This is a... This is, um, this is Mosaic Creek Park, where 600 people from the community designed whatever they wanted, and uh, with the artistic direction of, of uh, Glenn, they were able to put this park together. So, I mean, as I was saying, it's sort of, it's not just the, the mosaic itself, but what you put on the mosaic. So with 600 people from the community creating this thing, you had a vast, vast, uh, beautiful, um, tapestry of stories, like uh, the woman who created a pebble mosaic that was in the shape of a mermaid with a mastectomy. And also there was a teenager who was so in love with his runners that he made a mosaic with uh, a Nike swoosh across. So I mean, with all of these different things, it sort of creates a very lively and vivid tapestry. It's a, it's a, real, it's a real dialogue right there. Um, I see a vagina dantata. Right there. <laughs> so it got me wondering, you know, how can we foster this kind of creative collaboration in Toronto? I didn't know how this might come about. So, you know, in order to gather some information, I called up the city of Toronto and I spoke with a, an officer from the public art department. And here's what I found out. So the Toronto Public Art Department is in charge of commissioning, overseeing, maintaining monuments and statues for the city's object collection. So it was described to me as a rigorous five-tiered process involving a chosen artist pitch, a panel of art experts, art curators, art consultants, and two members from the community, one who also brings art expertise. And together, they help to develop the artist proposal, and the public is... Um, an, to create this piece of public art, and then that is finally delivered in the responsibility of the artist. So it's given rise to public art like this. Oh, sorry, not like this. That was the mosaic in Vancouver. Sorry, these are, these are Vancouver mosaics. And kids, can you imagine? A kid walking by and go, hey, I made that. You feel pretty good about that. So, okay, I was saying, um, to about Toronto, so it has a five-tiered process. Um, there are no suits involved in, in that process. It's all art, arts people and art experts and two people from the community, one of which who brings art expertise. So it's um, through that process that's given rise to this. Uh, one of the mandates is to work with the landscape of the area of which the art is going up, and I see they've worked with the chain link fence. Uh, that is on Spadina, the thimble, in the former garment district. I don't know if much clothing is being made down there these days. I think a lot of it's being um, made elsewhere. But okay, so I'm not. So this is the thimble, and I went down there on a brisk day to take a photo of it. I kind of like the Do Dr. Zeus quality to it, but again, I was kind of oh, somebody's graffitied on it and written "lick me." And then, of course, in my neighborhood, uh, Kensington Market, there's the Al Waxman statue. I gotta say, I do like Al Waxman, and it was a funny thing to see because when the when the when the sculpture first went up, there was a public outcry because Al was too skinny. <laughs> so Al was immediately covered with garbage bags, and there he was covered for a good while until he was fattened up, and then he was re-revealed. So. As far as uh, participation of the people who live in the community itself, uh, they are asked for their opinion on the piece of public art and what they'd like to see, but it's very rare that people participate in the art making itself. Though there have been a couple of projects, including a recent contest for manhole covers, uh, cover designs that was open to the public. 
it's not that we don't have community engaged art, we do, but it falls under a different department outside of public art. It's known as community art, which is a part of art services. Now, most of the community art projects are performance-based, culminating in a theatrical event or a parade or a dance. There are mentoring programs that teach skills like puppet making, set design, drawing comics, taking photographs. There are boutique workshops, and those can lead to the creation of a book or an art exhibition, sometimes murals on walls of sides of the buildings. Now, the Vancouver art, Public Art Department is slightly structured differently. Like Toronto, it oversees the acquisition of sculptures and monuments for the city's object collection. But Vancouver's Public Art Department also extends to public art created by the community. So it also includes the mosaic projects that were directed by artists like Glenn and Marina. Vancouver's Public Art Department has a wider jurisdiction. It seems there are not as many departments as in Toronto's infrastructure. So I asked Karen Henry and Monty Rice in Vancouver's Public Art um, what they thought were the groundbreaking ideas at the heart of the vibrant public art in Vancouver. And Karen says that it begins always with artists who create the ideas behind the projects. She also recognized the groundbreaking work that was done by city officials like Susan Gordon in the downtown east side in the early 90s. Marnie, on the other hand, says that good ideas require a leap of faith on the part of the city to trust an artist's vision. And so going back to the pebble mosaic artist, Glenn Anderson, I asked him, you know, what's, what's there? And he said, well, he thinks that it was a part of the natural evolution of Vancouver's thriving art scene of the time. It was a time when original ideas were championed, and there was a very freewheeling and inquisitive spirit that drove a lot of the work. And Vancouver today owes much of its beauty to that particular creative movement and mindset. Now another thing that is worth stealing in Vancouver is the Vancouver Mayor's Art Awards. Now there is a very key difference between Vancouver's Art Awards and Toronto's Art Awards. And that is in Toronto, we give uh, one artist the award. In each category, we give it to one artist. Where is in Vancouver, each award is given to two artists. A senior artist who is honored for their work selects an emerging artist to share the award with and the cash prize. So in this way, there's a kind of passing of the torch from one generation to the next. Um, I'm going to show you a really beautiful piece of art. 